Genesis 28, verse 10. We got it? Okay. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and he put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid. And he said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz from the beginning. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. 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 So, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about Jacob and his journey into the land of Haran. And we all know the story of Jacob, how he tricked his brother and stole his birthright and tricked his father as well and got a blessing because we find out that there were certain things that was important to Jacob did you all realize that there were certain things that were very important to Jacob and one of the things that in studying about Jacob we've understood is that he really cared about the blessings of God and how God thought about him he wasn't too interested in a relationship with God, but he was a guy that was determined to receive that which God asked for himself. In other words, he said this, God, you know what? I will not know you like my father knows you. I will not be as prayerful as my daddy prays. And you know all these things they talk about meeting you and you talking to them and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's keep that for daddy. But 
I know that there are some things in you that I need. And the same I get those things in my life, my life will never change. In other words, I may not know you that well, but at least I know you enough to understand that promotion does not come from the east or from the west, but promotion comes from above. I know you enough to understand that except you touch my life, I will amount to nothing. So he retained this type of knowledge in him. So the Bible says, as he traveled to Beharan, you all know the story. He finds himself in this spot. And he it was late, so he falls asleep. But before he slept, he gathered some stones and he used them as a pillow and he slept. And when he was alone by himself in that deserted place, the Spirit of God decided that this is the time for me to unveil myself to this guy. And truthfully speaking, Jacob did not know God. He didn't have any relationship with him. And God knew that. So when God was, was introducing himself, himself to Jacob, he said, I am the God of your father Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. But he did not say, I'm the God of Jacob, because he wasn't Jacob's God. And Jacob also said, when he vowed, he said, if Lord, you have, without fail, you, you take me on this journey, give me food to eat and raiment to put on, and bring me back to my father's house, then will God be my God. Hallelujah, you remember that. So he, they, they all agreed, we don't know each other. But today, we are going to start something. Glory be to God forevermore. Hallelujah. God says, yes, I understand you don't know me. And Jacob says, yes, I understand you don't know me either. But you know what? It doesn't matter what the past has been. We can start something fresh today. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the past has been. This morning, it doesn't matter what your history is. You are in the presence of God. And God can start something new today. Hallelujah. God can start something fresh today. It doesn't matter where you are coming from. Amen. The enemy a master of undermining our lives by our past and our history. But today God sent me to come and tell you it doesn't matter what the history be. Jehovah is here, you are here and something new is about to break forth. <laughs> oh glory to God. So so this guy this guy lays down and he goes to sleep and the Bible says he has a dream and when he had a dream he saw this ladder mounted up People of God, hallelujah. Let's be sensitive enough to understand that there are some dreams, they are not just dreams. That is the voice of God. It is the counsel of the Holy Ghost. Don't wake up in the morning and just brush it off. So when, when he had a dream, of course, you know, he saw the angels ascending and descending and, and he saw God Almighty standing on top of the ladder. And God begins to talk to him. And he gave him this enormous promise. And he said, listen to me, man, the land on which you just fell asleep and woke up, I, the Lord, I will give it to you. I will give it to your seed. And re emphasize the promise he had made to Abraham and to Isaac and told Jacob that your seed, out of your seed, and the whole earth be blessed, talking about Jesus Christ. But when Jacob got out of that place, in spite of all that he had heard, the Bible says what grieved him was the fact that that place where he slept was God's place and he didn't know it. Who cries about not knowing that God is in the place after you've received such a promise? Because Jacob was of a different attitude to the things of God. In his mind, if God is in the place, then my attitude must change. If God is in the place, then the way I relate to that place must change. I cannot take that place for granted anymore. If the, in the past minute I, I took something for granted, the moment I discovered that God is a part of it, my attitude must change. And if I know in advance that God is a part of something, then the way I approach it must what must change. You can't say that God is in the place or God is with something or part of something and you take it for granted. It should affect the way you think, it should affect your approach. Oh, people of God, I hope you understand what I'm saying this morning. That is the mindset that Jacob possessed. He said, if God is in this place, hallelujah, I must approach this place with care. I must approach this place with seriousness. I must approach this place, hallelujah, not casually. People of God, there are many of us, we take our spiritual work casually.
casually. Your walk with God is a very casual thing. Hallelujah. You do it because somebody told you to do it. You must go because your wife is going or your husband is going. Or if you don't go, your children will ask you. Are you an idol or a That's why you go to church. But people of God may talk that change today. Hallelujah. We come into the house of the Lord with the seriousness because we came to see God. So that is why the guy was, was crying about the fact that God is in this place and I didn't know how dreadful is this place. If God is in this place, then man, this place is a very scary place. I can't just walk around and be acting the way I'll be acting when I'm at home. No, no, this is different. This is very different. God is in this place. He says, you know, I can actually lose my life not knowing. In the things of God, hallelujah, let's make sure we are not ignorant. And those of us that claim that we know God, hallelujah, let's, let's esteem him, let's honor him, let's show by the way we live our life that indeed we know him. Some of us, even the way we talk about God shows that we don't know him. We just went to church and we have memorized some pastor's sermon and we are reciting it. But when you know God, it affects everything about you. It affects everything about you. It affects everything. I mean, if everything means everything, nothing is left out. So when somebody that knew you before you know God meets you now, they should be able to tell that something is different about your life. They should be able to tell that something is totally different about your life. Hallelujah. That is the Jacob way of living. If, if God is in this place, then it must affect the way I live. I connect to that presence by the way I order my life. You see, when, when I got saved, I was very young. I was very, very young when I got saved. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up around church like some of you. Some of you, you know, you grew up me. The only time I went to church was Easter and Christmas. And Christmas, I couldn't wait for Christmas because we go to show off our nice clothes. That's when we all, that's all we all do. They bought me some nice pair of shoes and some clothes and I got to go to church. You can't wait for that. But really, that, that was all. So all year long, Growing up, you only go to church twice. Easter, well, New Year's Eve, no, I'm out there doing something else. Amen. Easter and Christmas, that is for sure. <laughs> Praise be to Jesus. So I didn't, you know, I really did not grow up around the things of God at all. As a matter of fact, I read the Bible before I even went to church. So I read things in the Bible. You know, sometimes when you are bored and there's nothing to read, you grab a New Testament. Give me a New Testament. And you begin to read and you read a New Testament. And you just read and read and read, you know, and really, it really doesn't matter. But you just read it. But when I went to church, the first day I went to church, and when I got over there and I saw the scriptures being manifested, and I saw demons being cast out. And they were coming out with shrill voices. And I saw everything documented in the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I said, I told myself, I said, the Bible is true. That is what I told myself. I said, the Bible is true. And the moment I told myself that, I said, then my lifestyle must change. Everything about me must change. I must relate to the word of God knowing that it is true. And that is what ended me. That's how I ended up where I am today. And I've not changed. Because you cannot say that the word of God is true and not change the way you live. And not relate to it like that. You have to change. You have to change. If you believe that God is in a place, you got, it must affect your attitude. If it doesn't, then either you do not believe, hallelujah, or you are just making up something. But if you truly believe, it must change and affect something in your life. This is why Jacob was crying, said, God is in this place. And I didn't even know. So you know what he did? He said, if God is in this place, then I have to engage him. Come on, somebody say, engage the Lord. Come on, somebody say, engage the Lord. Come on, somebody say, engage the Lord. I told you, hallelujah. When I have difficult times and I have challenges and, and things are tough, I don't even pray at home. Hallelujah. I just sneak in here at an odd hour. I don't even bother turning the lights on. Because I know my way around here anyway. I ain't going to get lost. I don't need the lights. And I just sit down. And I say, Lord, I know you are here. And I'm here to talk to you. Sometimes I bring letters. And I come and I put it before the altar. 
and I leave it there and I talk to God about them and it works it out because I know he is here he was what tells me and he has shown us so I cannot have this understanding and not relate to him like that so when I walk into this place on the, and I'm talking about this building I'm not talking about spiritual church I'm talking about this building place here Anderson Road 4734 Anderson Road I walk into this place I know for a fact I'm walking into the presence of God and my attitude must change that is why I am able to receive that which I need from him and that was Jacob's mindset so he said God if you are in this place look go, go, go down there with me look at verse 20 look at verse 20 before before we read verse 20 Let's let's go let's go up. I, I want to show you this. Look at verse thirteen. Look at verse thirteen. Verse thirteen. We got it. Verse thirteen. Genesis twenty-eight. And behold, the Lord stood above it. Am I right? And said, "I am the Lord God of who? Come on, somebody say Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, thy father." But he didn't say the God of Jacob. They had a mutual understanding. We don't know each other. And he says, the land whereon thou liest, to thee would I give it, and to thy seed. Alright? And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. In other words, he will multiply him. Amen. Talking about his spiritual seed. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is why we are blessed. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And he says, behold, I am with thee. And will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So God had made him a promise. He says, Listen, I'm not going to leave you until I bring you back to this place and until I have done that which I have spoken to you about. Am I right? Okay. Now let's go to verse 20. Hallelujah. Look at verse 20. Woman, I said verse 20. This one is refusing to go to verse 20. Somebody, your miracle is in verse 20. Oh, somebody say amen. amen. There's always a way. Look at verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow. Alright, look at the vow that Jacob made. Saying, If God will be with me. Everybody say, If God will be with me. If God will be with me. But God already told him that I will be with you. Am I right? Verse 32, I'm going to be with you and I will work with you and I will do everything I've spoken to you about. So why would you turn around and say, if God will be with me? God already told you he's going to be with you. Hmm. Hey, well, glory to God. Let's continue. It says, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. And God said, I'm going to go with you, hallelujah, and I'll bring you back here. Amen. So it was already settled that God was going to work with him. And then he says, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. God already told him, I'm going to bring you back to your daddy's home. And he said, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the ten unto thee. Now, Jacob is here making a vow and promising God and telling God about that which God had already told him I would do. Why would you go, hallelujah, and engage God and, and ask God to do that which he's already told you to do and make him a promise? That Lord, if you actually do these things, hallelujah, if you be with me, give me raiment to put on food to eat, bring me back to my father's house in peace, hallelujah, then this stone that I've set for a pillar shall be your house. And of all that you give me, I'll give one tenth to you. Why would he do that? And then you shall be my God, thank you. Why would he say all these things? Because in the world of Jacob, he must be in charge. That is Jacob's world. That is why he wanted God so bad. Because he knew of the might of God and the power of God. And he says, if I get this guy on my side with his power and might, 
then I can really rule my life. So when God made him the promise, as wonderful as the promise was, it was not enough. Jacob says, I have to engage you. Now, I cannot go and, 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 and be thinking, of, is God really going to do what he said he's going to do? Is God really? He says, I don't have time for that. And I have a way, there is a way for me to solve that. I'm going to get you engaged. So he said, Lord, you know what? I'm going to make you a vow. <laughs> I'm going to make you a promise right now that if you will go with me and you give me food to eat and you give me clothes to put on and you bring me back to my father's house, then I will build you a house and then you shall be my God. And God says, wow. Is there anything I'm looking for in this life? Yes, I need somebody to build me a house. And you know what, Jacob? Initially, you didn't know me and I didn't know you and I've always wanted to know you and for you to know me. So he said, you're going to know me, you're going to serve me. It's a done deal. When you feel the presence of God, when you can fully say that God is manifested in something, engage him. Engage him. Don't just let the move pass by. When you come into the house of the Lord, you come to church, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost is flowing, and you can feel his presence. Engage him. Don't just let things pass you by. I cannot just stand just like and say, let God move and just go. No, I have to wait in the stream. You know what many of us, we've allowed the waves of God and the streams of God to pass us by. And this morning, even as I'm preaching the word, I can see the stream and it is still flowing. And you know what I can see also? There are all manner of things in that stream. And if somebody would take a step of faith and step into it, then you can have. Then you can have. So when you begin to sense the presence of the Holy Ghost, engage God. Engage God. When you see that God is part of something, He's doing something, engage Him. Don't just let it pass you by. Sometimes I come up here and I say, I feel the Lord wants us to do this and this and this. And I need folks to sow seed or whatever it is, you know. And well, you're like, okay, praise the Lord. But I just wait in the stream. There are some people here, they never allow anything to pass them by. That is how they got a blessing. So when Jacob was making God this vow, hallelujah, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was engaging God. So when he went into his uncle Laban's house, the, the guy saw him as this feeble guy that you can take advantage of. Because his mother is not here, his father is not here. In those days there were no telephones, so he can call and tell anybody that you have mishandling him. So let's abuse him. So they took 14 years of his life. But you know what? But after the 14 years, God had used those 14 years to transfer the wealth of Laban into Jacob's life. If they had known that they would have sent it off after the second year. Somebody may think they are taking advantage of you, not worry. Somebody thinks that they are, they are messing you up and they are just destroying your stuff and you know, you don't know anything. So they're going to take, don't worry, don't worry, hallelujah. They are the ones who don't know anything, they are the ones who are ignorant. Because God is with you. And as he stands with you, if somebody takes your one dollar, he's going to bring back ten dollars. Because you see, if you sow your tithes and your offerings and you are faithful to God, nobody can take your money. Even IRS cannot take your money. No. They will take everybody else and say, leave yes and no, we don't want this one. Please take this one back. Because you have already fulfilled your spiritual obligation. You have engaged God. When your children are about to go to school at the beginning of every year. Engage God on your behalf. Every morning when your children are about to go to school, before you put them on the school bus, engage God. Know how you engage God? Say, kids, come. You're about to go to school and you lay hands on them and you speak over them. You're going to have a great day. Ugly teachers will not find you. If your teacher is ugly, they meet you, they're going to be beautiful. Just for you. No substitute teacher is going to come in and come curse you out. I prophesy over you that whatever you do, you go going to succeed and you go make it. You are engaging God. So the child goes to school, hallelujah, with a promise over their lives. I 
As a matter of fact, parents, can I share a secret with you? Some of you, by the time your kids are going to do, you are so mad because you're looking for their shoes, you're looking for their socks, you're looking for this, you're looking for that, you can't find their homework, and you are mad and frustrated. If you are not careful, you say the wrong word. And they carry that to school. Engage God. Engage God. How many of you that know that God is with you? Amen. You know why He is with you? So you can engage Him any day, any minute. He didn't have to tell us. He could just walk with us. But He wants us to be aware so that we can engage some of the most powerful prayers that I've prayed, they were not the ones that I was hiding in my prayer closet. They are the ones that I spoke when I was behind my driving, steering wheel, driving. Because he's with me. I can engage him any time, any minute, anywhere, any place. Engage him in faith. And he will answer you. Let's be the Jacob of our generation. Engage God. This is a wonderful church that we have here. Find a way to serve. Engage God. Let God be obligated to you. You see, me personally, my life is sold out to him. Hallelujah. He was the one that saved me. I would have gone to hell straight. So since he saved me, hallelujah, he's obligated to me. And I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to love him. And I'm going to live for him. So he knows to take care of me. He knows. And he's never filled me. Even at times when I thought that, man, God, you let me now. Years later, I go back and I thank him. I say, Lord, thank you for not answering my prayer at that time. I was so ignorant. I like the way you did it. I encourage you. Live a life that engages God. Make vows. Make promises. Make commitments. Commit yourself to something in the house of the Lord and fulfill it. In these things, shall the Lord rise up on your behalf. One of these days when you need it most. When all earth fails, you know that there is a resource you have not tapped into. It is called your heavenly resource. Hallelujah. Yeah. When everybody is telling you that this can never be, you say, yes, this is earth speaking. But heaven has not spoken yet. And heaven will speak on my behalf because I have spent time to engage God. Give the Lord a mighty God. So when Jacob was ready to leave Laban's house, the Bible says the attitude of the whole house was against him. They didn't like him. They thought that he came over there poor. Now he just got all the money. He's the one who is rich and all that kind of stuff. And everybody was against him. So he said, no, it's time for me to go home. And he was so afraid. He couldn't tell his uncle that he's leaving. So one day the uncle went out with his sons. When they came back, Jacob was gone. He fled. As always. And then Laban was furious. So this guy, let's go after him. This is amazing. When they set out to go after this guy, after Jacob, as they were traveling, the Bible says God appeared to Laban. Jacob didn't know this. God appeared to Laban and says, Laban, where are you going? He says, I am going to look for that boy, that rascal called Jacob that has stolen my children, stolen this, stolen that. And God says, listen to me, man. That guy has obligated me. He has made a vow to me. He says he's going to build me my house in Bethel and I'm waiting. He also told me that I'm going to be his God. So I am warning you on his behalf. Feel free to go and meet him as your nephew. But I warn you, don't speak to him good or evil. In other words, if you like, turn back and go home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, that's another option. But you can turn around and go back home. But if you still insist on going to meet him, when you get there, make sure you don't tell him good or evil. 
because I'm going to deal with you. And Laban got a message. So then he got over there and said, Hey, Jacob, why did you live like that? Come, let's together. Come. You know I'm always your uncle. I love you very much. And I'm your mother's brother. And whatever. Come, let's cook. Let's eat. Let's have fun tonight. I thought was like, oh my God, what happened to this guy? <laughs> Listen to me. God is going to visit your boss. God is going to talk to them before they get to you. Hallelujah. And God will warn them and say, hey, that girl in your office, they not speak good or evil to them. The same individual that walked out of the office fuming last night. They come back to the end, they bring you a box of donuts. That's how God works. Give them a big clap for this morning. Hallelujah. No, no, no. We are not joking. Amen. We are not joking.